This is the Space Black MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro, the latest Pro laptop from Apple. And while it offers a different color and some spec bumps over the previous generation, there are a couple of things that on the surface may look like downgrades, but when you dig into them are much more complex. For the past week or so, I've been diving into the M3 Pro doing my own tests. I wanted to find out where this machine has improved both from a technical and practical standpoint, and if it makes sense for someone to upgrade over the last couple of generations. So if you're in the market for a new MacBook, or you just want to get a rundown on how everything on the M3 Pro works, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. November releases for Apple products are kind of uncommon, and to be honest, the M3 announcement completely caught me off guard. The M2 Pro and M2 Max machines came out earlier this year, so I definitely wasn't expecting a new chipset to come out for at least a couple of months, but it makes sense that Apple would want to sneak these in during the holiday season. The question that I had after watching the Scary Fast Apple event was how much different can these actually be, with the gap between the M2 Pro and the M3 Pro only being eight to nine months? Well, after using the MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro and putting it through the paces for the past week or so, it's kind of complicated. The biggest difference visually is obviously the color. I have the new Space Black model, and the interesting thing about this color is you can only get it if you choose the M3 Pro chip and above, so the base M3 MacBook Pro will not have this option. Unlike the MacBook Air in the midnight color, this doesn't show fingerprints really at all due to the new anodization process on this machine. It will show dirt and dust a little bit easier than the lighter colors, and the jury is still out on how it will wear over time, but just from a pure aesthetic standpoint, I think it looks fantastic. Some people say this looks like more of a gray, but to me it still looks black. It just got a little bit of a shimmer to it, which gives it more of a premium feel, and with everything being black, I just find it feels a little bit more cohesive as opposed to having the two-tone look of the silver with a black keyboard. The last time Apple offered a legit black MacBook that didn't have a shade of some other color, I believe it was between 2007 and 2010, so this is a welcome addition, and having the matching black MagSafe charging cable is a nice touch as well. The model that I have here is the 14-inch version, so you get the same 14.2-inch screen and 3024 by 1964 resolution as the M2 variant, with one minor change, which you'd think might be notable, but really doesn't make a huge difference. When I reviewed the M2 Pro MacBook Pro earlier this year, one thing that I talked about was how the 1600 nits peak brightness was only for HDR content, which we rarely ever utilize, and what we should be paying attention to is the SDR brightness, which is more of what we're looking at with everyday use. That peaked at 500 nits in that machine, and compared side by side with the models that didn't have a Retina XDR display but shared the same SDR peak, the brightness was actually about the same, but this M3 Pro is supposed to be a little bit different. The Retina XDR display in the M3 MacBook Pro goes all the way up to 600 nits in SDR to match the Apple Studio display, so it technically does get a little bit brighter, but placed side by side with a 500 nits peak brightness device like the M2 MacBook Air, you can't really notice any difference at all. In the real world, there might be an off chance it could be more visible if you're working in a very bright area or in direct sunlight, but regardless, it is nice to see that it's matched to the same levels as the studio display if you got the two paired together. Just don't expect it to look all that different from the last generation. Just like any other XDR display, it has extremely high contrast, outstanding uniformity in black levels with no light bleed, Colors all look fantastic and very accurate, whether you're watching content or working in color critical apps. With things like photo and video editing and graphic design, you don't have to worry about colors or contrast being off of this display. And arguably just as important, if not more so with most of those tasks, will be what's on the inside of the machine. The configuration that I have here is the base M3 Pro, and it has a couple of notable differences over the base M2 Pro. You get 18 gigs of RAM instead of 16, and an extra core on the CPU with 11 cores versus 10 on the base model. The cores have kind of been swapped around, so you get five performance cores and six efficiency cores versus six performance and four efficiency in the M2 Pro base. And on the GPU, you've got 14 cores with hardware accelerated ray tracing, where the M2 Pro base had 16 without ray tracing. This does seem to be a confusing blend of upgrades and downgrades on the surface. The memory bandwidth also dropped down to 150 gigabytes per second versus 200 on the M2 Pro, but the real question is, what does this actually look like in real world performance? This is where things get interesting and why you have to be careful with things like benchmarks because they don't always tell the full story. I read a bunch of different benchmarks and the CPU stayed somewhat consistent across most tools in that you'd see between a 17 and 18% increase in single and multi-core performance over the last generation. But in actual use, if I'm being completely honest, even the base M2 chip is still more than capable for most things. I can tend to have somewhat of a demanding workflow and I've still managed to get quite a lot done on just the base M2 MacBook Air. I know there are still limited 
limitations with the absolute base machines that come with eight gigs of RAM. But my point is, if you're just looking at raw CPU power, I don't think that's something that most folks are really wanting or clamoring for with any M series machine. Sure, there are still use cases where we want that extra power and where the M2 Max and M3 Max ships will be much more proficient. I know personally where I feel some pain is when I'm editing videos with a ton of layers and effects. That can slow down my system, especially if I have background rendering turned off in Final Cut Pro, but the M3 Pro behaves very similar to my Mac Studio. Maybe not quite as smooth placing them side by side, but I'm not sure that I would notice in my regular day to day. Where the M3 Pro gets really interesting and what's a little more noticeable in everyday use are some of the things that sit outside of just CPU processing, the first of which is the media engine. This is one thing that kind of shocked me. The M3 Pro only has a single encoded decode engine where the Max chips have two of them. So you'd think that the M2 Max in my Mac Studio would still run at about twice the speed when rendering out a video, but I found the M3 Pro to be a little bit better than expected. I had to run a bunch of different tests because I didn't trust my eyes at first. The M2 Max was only about 11% faster than the M3 Pro when I tried rendering out shorter videos in Final Cut Pro, and about 33% faster with longer videos filled with effects, where the M2 Pro is about half the speed of the M2 Max. So this is a bit more capable in that regard. The media engines in all the new M3 chips also have AV1 decoding included. That's essentially just for video playback with the AV1 codec that's supposed to have a nicer picture as compared to something like H.264. So you might see that pop up with streaming services and is a nice inclusion, but doesn't really have any effect on overall performance. The GPU is something else that I found a little bit misleading and where you have to be careful when you're looking at benchmarks. One of the first things I did when I fired up this machine was try out some games and I found them to feel much smoother than on the base M2 Pro, but when I ran Geekbench, the GPU score was around the same value and in fact was not as good as the M2 Pro. The problem with Geekbench and some of these other benchmarking tools is that they're not yet optimized for the hardware-enabled ray tracing and upgraded memory allocation in this machine. So if I go over to something like Cinebench 2024, it scores at almost twice the speed of the M2 Pro. So just be aware that benchmarks aren't always the equivalent of real world use. Like I said, I did try this out for gaming and it was a bit of a mixed bag. There's no substitution for a good gaming PC, obviously, but it does work well with the games that I have available. Gaming isn't something that most folks plan on using with Macs or MacBooks, but I did want to give it a go because it does seem to be something that Apple is pushing a lot more. And in other practical applications like Blender, I found it to feel a lot smoother and render a bit faster than the M2 Pro as well. With the experimental ray tracing option turned on, I saw about twice as fast render times as on the M2 Pro, so the reduction in cores seems to be a non-factor provided what you're doing is optimized for this GPU. Like the GPU, storage was another aspect of this machine that I was a little bit surprised with. The base version still comes with a 512 gig SSD, but Unlike the M2 Pro and Max machines that opted for a much slower SSD than the M1 Pro and Max base, this is now back up considerably higher with 15 to 26% faster write times and about 40% faster read times. Again, it's only in some pretty specific edge cases that you're likely going to notice the speed differences, even between the base air machines all the way up to the super fast high capacity Pro models. They're all very performant, but it's still nice to see that get bumped up, which I wasn't expecting. One of the most exciting things to me surrounding the M3 chipset was that it's built on a 3 nanometer process, which is down from 5 nanometers on the previous M series chips, meaning that the components inside the chip are much smaller. That often equates to better efficiency and battery life, and out of all the things that MacBooks could get better at, battery life would be one that probably would make the biggest difference for most people, even though it's been great for years now. We could all use a little more juice. This battery is just a touch bigger than in the M2 Pro version, coming in at 72.4 watt hours versus 70 in the M2 Pro and the M3 base version of the 14 inch MacBook Pro. But unfortunately, overall battery life seems to have stayed about the same, maybe a slight improvement over the last generation, but nothing noticeable just using the machine. I've been getting pretty much a full day of battery running tests and benchmarks and cranking up the screen brightness and pushing up video and audio no problem. And it only takes a couple of hours to charge from low battery to full. Most of the other things included in the newest MacBook Pro are all relatively the same as the previous gen. You've got the same great six speaker high fidelity sound system with force canceling woofers that push out amazing audio, the same 1080p webcam and the same microphones. The wireless connectivity is also unchanged with Bluetooth 5.3 and Wi-Fi 6E. 
I'm a huge fan of Wi-Fi 6E, but this may have been an opportunity to include Wi-Fi 7 like we've seen on some other devices. My Google Pixel 8 Pro has Wi-Fi 7, and if that's included on a phone, I'm sure it's possible to throw in a laptop, but that is nitpicking. I am gonna continue to plug away on this machine and put it through the paces, but when it comes down to it, if you're wondering if you should buy this machine, I think that all depends. If you've already got an M2 series Mac, in most cases, there really isn't any reason to upgrade and the performance gains are minuscule at best. But if you've bought an M1 three years ago or you're on an old Intel machine, it's definitely worth checking out, but I will make one suggestion. Right now, these are gonna cost you $19.99 USD, which isn't cheap. And if you wanna save yourself some money, there are M2 Pros available on the Apple Refurb site that are basically new for much cheaper. So you can't save yourself some cash there and not feel like you're missing out too much. The difference in the M3 Pro over the M2 Pro isn't huge, but it is noticeable in some areas. And even though it seems like a mix of upgrades and downgrades on paper, the M3 Pro is generally more performant and a slight upgrade over the previous model. I'll keep playing around with this laptop and probably make a long-term follow-up video with it, so if there's anything that you guys want to know about this down the road, let me know and I'll try and work in the things that I see the most of from people. And I also wanna know what your general take on this MacBook is. You like the space black? Are you upgrading to the M3 Pro or any of the other versions that were just announced? Let me know in the comments down below. That is it for me today. I hope you found this video useful or entertaining. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you wanna see more tech related content or help me determine what the difference is between space grays and blacks and regular ass grays and blacks, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.